So I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Shravan Kumar. Uh, Shravan is the John R. and Louis S. Parker Distinguished Professor of Mathematics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He received his PhD from the University of Mumbai and um, TIFR Mumbai in 1986 under the direction of S. Ramanan. Uh, Shravan was an invited speaker at the ICM 2010 in Hyderabad. He's a fellow of the American Mathematical Society. He'll speak today on conformal blocks for Galois covers of algebraic curves. So, Thank you very much, Prakash. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be speaking in this conference, uh, especially because it's uh, this part of the conference is honoring uh, uh, Professor Narasimhan and Professor Sashadri. Uh, I have had the, uh, the privilege of working with Narasimhan and in fact, the, the, uh, the topic I'm going to talk about uh, was introduced me uh, by Professor Narasimhan. Uh, uh, he showed me, as I wrote in my book, he showed me this beautiful garden of uh, this theory of conformal blocks uh, and its geometric counterpart. So let me begin. So I am going to share my screen and let me tell you, please uh, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Uh, and let me also know if you cannot hear me properly or you cannot read what I read, uh, write properly. So I am going to change to this uh, uh, sharing screen mode. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, so what I'm going to talk about uh, is a joint work with my colleague, Juju Hong. But before I, I really go to the Galois cover uh, and conformal blocks there, I'm going to recall the classical theory of uh, this conformal block. So I will introduce the notation so far for the classical theory. And then at some point, uh, uh, I will come to the part which is the main focus of this talk. So, so some notation. So let G, be a simply connected complex algebraic group uh, and uh, be a simply connected simple complex algebraic group and sigma a reduced uh, projective curve. So I'm not assuming the curve to be smooth right now. So by S pointed curve, uh, we mean sigma together with bunch of points P1 through PS. So S is some integer bigger than or equal to one, where the PIs are smooth points. So that's the only requirement that the points PI are the smooth points. Okay, so we are going to fix a level R uh, the central charge C. So, so we are going to fix a, a level C, which is a, 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 is a strictly positive integer. Uh, and this will be fixed once and for all. Now let's define DC. So this is the dominant uh, uh, integral weights uh, for the level C. So this consists of all the weights. Okay, I have to introduce a bunch of notations such that lambda alpha I check is in Z non-negative and lambda theta check is less than or equal to C. Okay, so, so what is H here? So H is a Cartan subalgebra of uh, Lie algebra of G. 
H star is the dual. Can I interrupt, Shravar? I think part of the screen is not visible. Your ah, okay, okay, okay. It's not visible. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you could center that page, it would be good. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Good. In fact, a little bit more, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Artan Sabajibra of Liji. Alpha I check are the simple co roots. And theta check is the, the co root corresponding to the highest root. Actually, if I make it a little bit higher, maybe you can see more of page. Ah. Okay, now DC, huh, okay, I, I have to also introduce this affinely algebra. which I will denote it by G hat. So where G is actually Lie algebra of G. So G hat by definition is nothing but G tensor function field uh, CT plus a central element C. And I am I mean, should I define the, the, the commutation? So X tensor F, Y tensor G is X, Y tensor F, G plus uh, X, Y, this is the killing form uh, times residue DF times G and residue is at equal zero where X, Y is the normalized, okay, I am I still in the page, is the normalized invariant form on, ah, okay, let's see, on G so that theta, theta is two. Okay, so that's the uh, finally algebra. Now, let's see. If I can keep both the pages, that will be a bit of a challenge. Yes. So now integrable highest weight G hat modules with central charge C, which means that is action. I can't see what you're writing, Shravan. Part of what you're oh, writing. You can't see. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Ah, I see. So it would be better if you put the second sheet of paper underneath the first one rather than side well, by side. No, I could, but I thought that at least I can share that. Okay, right now I can see it. Yeah, this better ah, now. Okay, okay, okay. Now the, the probably the print is a bit smaller. Is it still readable? Well, I can, but I'm not sure everyone can. Uh, let's see, can you all read? Okay, the choice is between keeping two pages together or making it slightly bigger. Okay, so I think let, let, let's keep it slightly bigger and maybe I will, I will dispense with the page, first page. Okay, so integrable highest weight G hat modules with central charge C are bijectively parameterized by DC. And if I take lambda in DC, the corresponding representation I'm going to denote it by H lambda. So now I am almost ready to define the space of dual conformal blocks. Okay. So space of dual conformal blocks 
uh, and that will be denoted by okay so so before i do that yes right so so the, so i'm going to define that so we have this s pointed curve sigma p uh, where p is nothing but p1 through ps and now we attach lambda 1 through lambda s attach to the points p where each lambda i is in dc okay. so now we define h lambda which is nothing but the tensor product of all these uh, the integrable highest weight modules and so now let's take the Lie algebra G tensor functions on sigma minus P. Now I am taking P to be at least one point. So sigma minus P is going to be an affine curve. So C of sigma minus P is the affine coordinate ring. So this will have lots of functions here. So we take this Lie algebra uh, and now I can define the conformal blocks, dual conformal blocks. Dual conformal blocks. Actually, if I orient. <laughs> yes. So dual conformal blocks, which I am going to denote it by let's keep the same notation. Yes. So this will be denoted by V sigma P lambda. So this is H lambda divided by G tensor C sigma minus P acting on H lambda. Okay. So, so first of all, so this is a Lie algebra. Uh, under the standard action x tensor f, y tensor g is nothing but x, y tensor f, g. And how does it act? So, so the action of g tensor c sigma minus p on h lambda is given by So at least something you can see. So this is given by, if I take X tensor F and acting on V1 tensor Vs, so where Vi is in H lambda I and F is in C sigma minus P, then it's nothing but V1 tensor, let's take X tensor F, at, okay, I have to explain that, acting on VI. Vs, I from one to S, so that's the action, where Ti is a local parameter on sigma at Pi, uh, observe that Pi is a smooth point, so we can talk about local parameter there. And F Ti is the Lorentz series expansion of F uh, at Pi uh, through Ti, through the coordinate Ti. So this is the object of, uh, uh, of main interest for us. And this is what is called the dual conformal block. There is also a dual notion of conformal block, which is basically the dual of this space. Now, now 
So let me begin with one lemma that V sigma P lambda is a finite dimensional vector space. Or C. Moreover, it uh, does not depend upon the choice of the local parameters Ti up to an isomorphism, up to a canonical isomorphism. And actually, I will have occasion to talk about canonical isomorphism. And let me say at the outset that whenever I say canonical isomorphism, it will always be understood up to a scalar constant, up to a canonical isomorphism. Well, too many up to which, up to a, uh, a scalar constant. So now the question is, so it's a finite dimensional vector space attached to the curve uh, with bunch of points on it and bunch of representations attached to that. So question, if you have a finite dimensional vector space, the most natural question to ask what is its dimension? Okay. So now th there was this conjecture by Verland, and I should say Eric Verland because there are two Verlands. And uh, so he gave a conjecture uh, as to what its dimensions should be. And I'm not going to state this precise conjecture. Uh, probably it's not going to shed much of a light as to what's going on, but I'm going to give you, uh, and this was made in 1988. Now, uh, so I'm going to give you what is the main uh, steps in proving this conjecture. So I'm going to briefly uh, 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 state the steps, and then we will move on to the, the, the actual topic of this talk, that is conformable block for the Galva covers. Okay, now let me say that, uh, okay, maybe I should talk about history first, but maybe let me give you the idea of the proof. So it involves these results, these main results. And first is propagation of vacua. So it's simply stated, it says that if I take V P lambda, then this is same as P and let's add one more point and add lambda and zero to that. Now this zero weight is in DC, but the corresponding representation is not a trivial representation because it's a central charge positive C. So the corresponding representation is, uh, uh, is not the, uh, uh, it's actually uh, what is called the basic representation. So this is, so I am attaching one more point. Oh, I should have said P consists of distinct points, S pointed curve attached to, so they are distinct points. And now I am attaching Q not in P, and I am attaching to the point Q the weight zero. So the propagation of Vekuva says that you can add uh, points to the, uh, to the S pointed curve, as long as you attach only the zero weight, the, the space does not change. Now, the second theorem is factorization theorem. And what it says that let sigma has a node Q. 
and it can have other nodes, but I'm just taking one node as a node Q, uh, and it's a S pointed curve. And now notice that Q being a node cannot be one of those points P. Now let's take the normalization. So I'm taking the normalization. Shavan, do you want to call the, the node also Q? Because the extra no, point I'm was calling Q. the node Q. Sorry, what is the suggestion? In the, just, just because in the previous slide, Q could not be a node, right? Now you're letting Q be the node. Oh, oh sorry, in sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. No, you have you have absolutely good point. Why not I just make it Q0 here? Okay. So, so in, okay. okay, right, right. No, this has to be a smooth point because it's S-pointed curve. So Q0 is a smooth point. No, you have very, very, uh, yeah, uh, good uh, reason to not call it. So Q0 was one of the points, the uh, distinct from P, uh, uh, the, this, uh, this set of points P. Okay, so I take a normalization at Q only. So there may be other nodes, I'm not normalizing them, I'm only normalizing the curve at Q only. So now this point Q will, break into two points, Q prime and Q double prime. And now let me state the factorization theorem says that there is a canonical isomorphism from V sigma P lambda to direct sum mu in DC. And now I'm taking V sigma hat. I am doing P and then Q prime and Q double prime and then I am taking lambda and then mu star and mu. Okay, so what, what have you been done? So now since we are normalizing only at the point Q, all the other points in P are, are kept intact in uh, uh, sigma hat. And that's why I'm not choosing a different symbol for them. So, so this is an isomorphism uh, away from Q. So I take the same P uh, 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 points and we are adding two more points, Q prime and Q double prime, and they have become smooth points now. Uh, and they are distinct from the P points. And now I attach the weight mu star and mu to those two points and take the corresponding conformal blocks and sum over this. Now you see this has genus. So suppose genus of sigma is G, then genus of sigma height is G minus one. So this will give us, and I'm coming to that in, uh, in just a few minutes. So this will give us an inductive procedure to calculate the dimension of the conformal block uh, starting from a genus G curve to going down to P1. Okay. Two, now, so, so on, so, can, I, can I interrupt just a, so the, so by, by genus, you mean arithmetic genus, right? What yes, that's right. Yeah. And this sigma hat could be disconnected. So what is the meaning of sigma genus? Sigma hat could be disconnected. That is right, indeed. Sigma hat could be disconnected. Uh, that could be the typical situation. Yes, indeed, you are right. But then, okay, so we say, what's the sig genus of sigma? What do you mean by sigma hat? It's obviously, it's obvious what you mean, of course, but... Um, yeah, but right. there is something to be said there. Some, right? some of the some of the genus of the two components. Okay. See, it cannot. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, yeah. so yeah, you, but it could disconnect. Yeah. So I have drawn a P one now, uh, joined at one point two P ones, and if I uh, normalize it, I'm going to get two copies of P one. So, uh, right, exactly, exactly. So, so you see, it's, it's still correct because genus of this one is going to be one. And once I normalize, it will become zero. So this is arithmetic genus. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah yes, yes, it could be disconnected. Yes, that's what I want. Yeah, it could, no, no, it definitely. In fact, not only it could be disconnected, I am going to use a situation when it better be disconnected, which I will come to that in, in just shortly. Now, so, 
So now we take sheaf of conformal blocks. So I define conformal block for a particular uh, S-pointed curve, one specific. Now let's take a family. So let's take sigma t to t, a family of S-pointed curves. So family means it should be proper flight family. Proper and flight family. And uh, so S pointed curves means sections PI. So I'm going to still call it P. Oops. So sections. P1, PS. Now PI are sections. Uh, so sections of this, so mutually disjoint. So these are mutually disjoint sections. And uh, so they all should land in the smooth points because then only it will be a pointed curve. So each fiber is a S pointed curve. For T, a geometric point in T. Okay, so once we have this situation, we can talk about sheaf of conformal blocks, which I'm not going to fully define. And this will be denoted by V sigma T and now still I'm going to write P and lambda. And we, we don't change lambda. So we still keep just. So the lambda is not varying uh, 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 in the family. So lambda is kept fixed. So sheaf of conformal blocks, one can uh, uh, easily define sheaf of conformal blocks. And now there is a theorem and this will be, uh, well, three was not a result. So I would just call it, okay, anyway, I don't have to number it. So theorem, so assume that T uh, is, okay, so let's assume that pi is a smooth morphism. Assume that T is a smooth and pi is a smooth morphism. Which basically means that all the fibers are smooth. Then, then this V sigma T P lambda admits a uh, projectively flight connection. In particular, V sigma T P lambda is a vector bundle. Now this has the beautiful consequence that dimension of this space V sigma P lambda uh, only depends upon the genus of sigma and the weights. So now we are going to, uh, to, uh, to have a notation for that. And let's call it mg lambda, which is the dimension of V sigma P lambda. The right half of your uh, piece of paper is not on screen. Uh, so say it again. Thanks, that's better now. Yeah, okay. So, so let's, 
so uh, by virtue of this last theorem, uh, we get that this uh, dimension of the space of uh, vacua uh, or dimension of co vacua does not depend upon the choice of the curve as long as you keep the genus fixed. And it does not depend upon the choice of the distinct smooth points P on the curve. It only depends upon the genus G and the weights lambda attached to those points. So now uh, we can legitimately uh, uh, set this dimension as mg lambda. Now, okay, so now I am more or less, yes. So corollary of the factorization theorem is that mg lambda is mg minus one lambda mu star mu summation over mu. And you can keep going. And finally, you will have m0 lambda. Okay, I am going to call mu1 star mu1, mu2 star mu2, and mu g star mu g. But someone you showed the connection only on the open part. So now how, how are you degenerating your curve then? Right. A uh, good point. Yes, good. <laughs> you have a very good point. Okay, so. Right, that's right. Okay, so, so there is an extension, okay, right. So there's an extension of the theorem, which says that we can, so this theorem remains valid uh, once we go to, uh, uh, to the moduli space of genus G curves, stable moduli space, right. So, so I should remark that. Okay, so where should I, yeah, so. Let's remark that the last theorem remains, okay, but I have to be careful here, remains valid uh, when T is the moduli space of S pointed stable curves. Okay, so last theorem remains valid means it uh, does, so it's, it's a logarithmic connection. Uh, so it's still the, 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 the in particular part, uh, which gives that V sigma T P lambda is a vector bundle. So, uh, so it does not admit a projectively flat connection, but logarithmic, uh, uh, so it has, it has poles uh, along the boundary of the, uh, this uh, uh, moduli space. Uh, but we can still conclude that this is space is a vector bundle and that's all we need. Okay, very good. So now uh, let's summarize what we have done. So from calculating the dimension uh, uh, of the conformal block for a genus G curve, we have reduced the problem to genus zero curve, but with, with many more points. So we have added two G points. Okay, now, now what we can do now further, and this picture, if I normalize this picture, and then again further by the factorization theorem, apply to, and I will just draw a picture here. So this is my P1 and this is my P1. So this is my sigma applied to this one. Uh, what we get is that now M0, uh, I'll just write lambda one, lambda two, lambda s, I can break it into m0 lambda one, lambda two mu, and then m0 mu star lambda three and lambda s, where mu is in dc again. So, so this tells us that we are reduced to 
calculating M0 with three points. So, so once we have, you, we have this decomposition, then uh, you can easily see that we are reduced to calculating M0 for three points. Uh, and this is achieved by the fusion product. by the fusion product uh, uh, on level C representations of the Lee algebra G. So the last step is, so by, by, by all these results, we have reduced the problem to understand M0. Uh, so that means on P1 with three marked points, and that problem is solved by using this fusion product on the level C representations of G. And in the end, by so once we have come to this point, by simple finite group proportion theory, one gets uh, to the precise formula for the dimension of conformal block for any uh, genus G curve and any weights lambda one through lambda S. Okay, so that's my crash course on the classical uh, uh, um, overland theory. So now comes the, the uh, okay, so this is now joint work. Ah, okay, so I should say something about history very briefly. So as I said, the conjecture was Verland 1988, and then there were uh, right. So, so one of the most important work in this uh, direction was done by Suchia, Yuno, and Yamada, and that is eighty-nine. Uh, and okay, so I have not told you that there is a corresponding picture, right? Uh, Yeah, so, okay, so let me, let me, let me say this. I am going to uh, write some names and four things, 94, and then And then uh, Polly ninety six and Laszlo Surger ninety seven and then Bismuth Labori. Uh, that is 97 and uh, 10, no, that's 93, sorry. And Teleman, 97. And also Bertram and Zenis and Thaddeus. And this is 1993, 91, and 94. Okay, so I have not followed any any either the yearly order or the alphabetical order. So, so excuse me for that. Okay, so there is a parallel picture. Uh, for the space of conformal blocks. Uh, 
in terms of uh, uh, sections, holomorphic sections of line bundles. Shravan, we can only see part of the thing. Yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, of line bundles on the moduli space of a semi stable parabolic G bundles on sigma. Okay, so I am not going to explain more about this for, for lack of time. So there is a completely parallel picture uh, involving the uh, 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 certain line bundles on the moduli space of semi-stable parabolic G bundles on sigma are equally uh, uh, by the moduli stack of parabolic bundles on sigma. So, so uh, and there is a canonical identification between those two spaces, so space of conformal blocks and holomorphic sections of line bundles on this moduli space. And actually these references which I have given tackles to this identification, some of the references really tackle to this uh, uh, identification. So I will not be more specific than that. Okay, so now comes our work. So this is Ju Ju Hong. I have for 15 minutes or so. Yeah. Okay, so, so let me tell you what the setting is. So we take, so setting. So we take a, a reduced projective curve is still just as before, sigma with the action of a finite group, gamma. So I'm going to take a, a reduced projective curve sigma as before, but now this uh, curve comes up, uh, comes equipped with the action of a finite group and let sigma bar be the quotient space. So that's uh, another projective variety. Uh, and what we require that we assume that sigma does not fix point-wise any connected component, no, any irreducible component. of sigma. So the only requirement is that sigma should not, well, we assume that any element, we assume that gamma and sigma, gamma different from one, does not fix point-wise any irreducible component of sigma. So, uh, so we have G as before, so that's a simple, uh, simple complex Lie algebra, which sounds a bit weird to a non-mathematician. A simple Lie algebra over complex numbers. That's probably better rather than I say I say simple complex Lie algebra. So so uh, of G as before. So uh, so we require that. Uh, gamma x on G as Lie algebra automorphisms. And we also require for many of the results which I'm going to talk about that sigma fixage a Borel subalgebra. Let's say B of G. 
So that's the setting we have, that we take a reduced projective curve with the action of a finite group, and we take a simple Lie algebra uh, 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 with the action of gamma, and we require that gamma is fixing a Borel subalgebra B and G. As I said, it's not required for all the results I'm going to talk about, but for many of them. So let, let me just, for convenience, let me put that. Okay, so definition. So a uh, S-pointed gamma curve is by definition uh, sigma P, again, P is P1 through PS as before. So that means that sigma is a gamma curve and PI are distinct, distinct smooth points in sigma. Moreover, we require that gamma P1, gamma PI is distinct from gamma PJ for all I different from J. So not only those are distinct points, but their orbits also, the gamma orbits also do not intersect. Okay. So now to every point PI, so to the point PI, we are going to attach a uh, twisted affine Lie algebra. And let me explain how, how, how are we going to do that. So gamma, so let's take gamma PI, the isotropy of uh, gamma at PI. So that's the isotropy subgroup of gamma. So those are the, the, the uh, group elements which uh, keep the point PI stable. Now we take the affine Kasmodi Lie algebra G hat as before. Can I, now, uh, and, someone, can I interrupt a second? I missed a question course. on chat. Uh, it's a question on chat, which, which asks, is the interpretation for V as sections of powers of a line bundle over bungee used in the proof of the Verlinde formula? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, so the, the proof of Berlin formula, as long as you are only interested in the space of conformal blocks, does not require uh, its identification with the space of sections on the line bundles on the parabolic moduli Steichar space. Uh, but that's a different interpretation for the same space. And there are some more direct proofs uh, of the dimension of this space of uh, 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 holomorphic sections uh, without going to the space of conformable blocks. And let's see the reference I wrote, uh, yes. So for example, uh, uh, Faltings has a proof uh, of the dimension formula are to some extent uh, without uh, uh, going to conformable blocks. And also the proof, yes, I should mention. So these proofs are Bertram, Zenes, and Tidius. That's a proof without going to conformal block, but it's only for S SL2. And Laszlo Sorger, no, so that requires uh, 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 identification. Now, Bismuth Labori is also a uh, direct proof. Uh, uh, for the holomorphic sections. Uh, it requires the symplectic geometry and there are some restrictions here. There, there are some restrictions uh, uh, which they have to impose. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, it does. I mean, I think this answers the question, Ashwin's question, although he should be the one who should say. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> should I move on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're in the, yeah. 
Okay. So just for the so notation, we, just to, um, so you have, you, have, you have X, gamma acting on X, and what's, did you name the quotient? I forget if you have named the quotient. Right. X so, mod gamma. So, uh, sigma bar. Sigma bar is the quotient. Okay. So, so sigma bar is the quotient, uh, 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 the gamma quotient of sigma. So it's again a, a reduced uh, a projective curve. Okay. So now and, we take G height as before, but we take the invariant. So now I am going to define G height based at PI, and that is G height. And you take gamma pi invariance there. So what? So let's go over this. What we did that we are taking g hat, the full affine Cosmodian algebra, but gamma pi, gamma pi is acting. So in fact, even gamma is acting on g. Now gamma pi is acting on. Uh, so so see g hat was G tensor C T, let's use T i plus C C. Now this gamma P i is acting on T i because T i is a local parameter and gamma P i is fixing the point. So it's going to act on the local parameter. Uh, so, so, so that means that gamma P i, so gamma is not acting on this one. But gamma pi is acting on this. Now we take the invariant. So this is what is called the twisted cos uh, affine algebra. Okay. Now, now this. So just like DC, irreducible representations. Irreducible. Okay. No. No. So this is integrable, highest weight. Uh, modules of G hat PI are parameterized by a slightly different set, which I'm just going to write DCPI. And I'm not going to describe what this set is it's a certain subset of DC, okay? So these are the integrable highest weight modules of G hat PI. They are going to be parameterized by DC PI. So now take lambda, which is lambda one, lambda S. Now lambda I should belong to DC PI. So they belong to different sets, depending upon the choice of the PI. So take lambda where each lambda is in DCPI. And now I'm going to, to define this module, which is H lambda one tensor H lambda S. Now keep in mind that H lambda I is a module for G hat PI. And these Lie algebras are, are uh, changing uh, with the point. So this is a tensor product representation for, so H lambda is a module for G hat P1, G hat Ps. Now, now let me define the, the, the most important object. So, uh, uh, so this is twisted dual conformal blocks. So the twisted dual conformal block again are attached to sigma, p, and lambda. And let me denote it by V sigma. And there is the group gamma. And now I'm going to uh, put here. So, so this is the, uh, the, the uh, space of twisted conformal block. And how is it defined? So gamma is the, the 
uh, action on, on sigma. So this is defined by taking H lambda just as before. And now we take G sigma minus gamma P. Let me, I will explain that in a minute acting on H lambda. So what are we doing here? So we take this H lambda, which is the tensor product of these, these uh, 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 separate modules. And now we are going to take co-invariant with respect to this Lie algebra. So what is this? Sigma minus gamma P is nothing but sigma. You take gamma PI and take I from one to S. That's what this is. Ah, okay, okay, and gamma invariants, sorry. Right, so now gamma of course is acting on G and gamma is acting on this one because I'm taking the union of some gamma orbits. So now we take the gamma invariants here. So that's a Lie algebra uh, and that acts on H lambda by a very similar formula as before and let me just point you to that formula, which is here. So we just take X tensor F V1 through Vs is like exactly like that. And we just take the, uh, the uh, uh, Laurent series expansion of the function F in the local parameter TI, we do that. So that's uh, exactly the same way. So the action is as before. Okay, so actually I am almost getting to the end of my time. So, so I guess we will have to, uh, uh, to uh, so uh, lemma that this is space V sigma gamma P lambda is finite dimensional and it does not depend upon the choice of the local parameters, Ti at Pi. Uh, actually, I am hiding something here. This choice of local parameter has to be adapted with the group action. So the group gamma PI is going to act on TI and it's going to multiply by something. So this multiplication be the, the, the primitive root of unity, uh, e to the power two pi I divided by that one. And we can always ensure that. So, so in any case, so now theorems. So propagation of vacua. Factorization theorem and uh, existence of uh, uh, projectively flat connection connection on a family on a smooth family. Uh, extension of the connection to the Hurwitz. Okay, let me get the spelling correct. What is this thing? Hurwitz. Uh, stack. Extension of the connection to the heuristic space with logarithmic singularities. So all these theorems are, are correct. I have not given you the precise formulation for lack of time, but all these theorems are correct. So again, the problem reduces to and one has to be careful exactly what it reduces to. 
and we still do not have the precise dimension formula. Uh, is given by Mukhopadhyaya uh, 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 and uh, and what's the uh, the co-author? Do you remember? Uh, I can't hear you, Prakash. I, I believe it's Tanmay Deshpande. Yeah, yeah, Deshpande. Exactly, Deshpande. I was trying to remember the last name. Yes. <laughs> so precise dimension formula is given by uh, uh, Deshpande and Mukhopadhyaya. So I think since my time is, is, uh, is uh, more than up, uh, I should stop here uh, for your questions. Uh, isn't there a related work of Damiolini here at the moment? Oh, that's right. OK. So here I should, no, no, no. Not only her. Yes. So. Right. So there are there are certain names I should uh, I should mention. So Frankel and S Z C Z E S N Y and then Kuroki. Uh, and Damiolini, right. Now, uh, they do not prove all these results in the generality we do. And let me not say exactly what they do. Uh, uh, and okay, so last theorem, I forgot to say, identification of Twisted conformal blocks with uh, the global sections on some moduli stack. So this was conjectured by uh, by Rappaport uh, and. Uh, Pepas, conjecture of Pepas and report. So, so we do identification of twisted conformal blocks with the global sections of sub uh, uh, on some modelized state, uh, which was conjectured by Pepas report. So we proved that. Yeah. Okay. Who? Any other yeah, questions? See, any questions? Anyone? Uh, so maybe you should thank the speaker first. Yeah. Are you finished, Shavan? Are you? Uh, I, I guess so. <laughs> well, <laughs> my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe, but the questions, maybe you could add more, right? It's yeah. yeah the, exactly. I mean, if there is any question. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So any questions? And then this can, yeah. I think we have 30 minutes yeah, for questions, uh, 25 minutes at least. Yeah. So um, uh, Ashwin has a question, but uh, yeah, Ashwin, can you ask the question, please? We can't hear you. We can't hear no. you. You're muted. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. yes, yes now yes. now I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you give some motivation for the uh, final section? Like uh, the initial part, uh, I sort of translated it in my head to questions about WZW model conformal blocks. Uh, okay. I'm trying to do that for the final part, but... I don't quite know what to do with the so final, final part group. means it's generalization to the twisted conformal blocks. Uh, when the uh, Galois covers start appearing. Right, right, right. So, uh, uh, so you mean some physical motivation? Uh, that, that would be fantastic. But I mean, if, if you want to explain your motivation in sort of mathematical terms, that's also. I mean, Okay, so 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 the question is that there are these moduli stacks 
which Pappas and Rappaport defined together with some line bundles. And the question was that, uh, how do you identify that space? So it's the other way around. So, so Pappas and Rappaport defined certain moduli stacks. Uh, 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 it, it, it's coming from Bruhart's group schemes, okay? So they had some, uh, some moduli stacks coming from Bruhart's group schemes and there are certain line bundles there. And the question was that what is the space of global sections there? And then it turns out that to, to really identify that space, you have to generalize this, uh, this uh, usual uh, uh, conformal blocks to these twisted conformal blocks. So at least that is the way we approached these twisted conformal blocks to understand what that is space of global sections age. So even though it appears as the last part of the results, but actually this is for me, uh, the main motivation is to understand what those conjectures are. And in fact, uh, Pappas and Rappaport hedge, uh, so they have a more general conjecture, see, because we cover not all possible Bruhartitz group schemes. Uh, we only cover a, some special class of Bruhartitz group schemes. And let me, let me explain that point to you, okay? So the, uh, so the Bruhartis group schemes we cover are the following. So let me, so again, the setting is that we have sigma and we have a group gamma, finite group acting on that. Okay. And now we take the trivial. Okay. So now we take the trivial group scheme over sigma. Okay. And now I'm going to do the veil restriction of, let me just call it G bar or maybe I can call it G sigma. So veil restriction of G bar sigma to sigma bar. Okay, and what is that object? So that object is uh, simply defined by, let me, yes. So, so let's take, if I take an open set U in sigma bar, or more generally, if I take a scheme over sigma bar, so take a scheme u over sigma bar. So that means that I have a like that. Then, then uh, this Brewer-Tisch group scheme is nothing but which takes u to, we take g u cross sigma bar sigma, and then I take the gamma invariance. Okay. So that's the, the, the uh, uh, so this is the Bruhartist group scheme. So this Bruhartist group scheme is taking any u over sigma bar to you take G U cross sigma over sigma bar. So I'm taking the fiber product of U and sigma over sigma bar and take the corresponding G. And now we take the gamma invariance there, okay? So that's the functor and it's a representable functor represented by this, uh, 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 this group scheme, which is called the Bruhartitz group scheme. So this is a special class of Bruhartitz group schemes. There is a more general definition of, uh, of Bruhartist group schemes, which um, actually I, I would not uh, dwell into. So it, it, it means that it's a group scheme over sigma bar, so that the generic fiber is like uh, uh, just G, but a special fiber is, uh, uh, is uh, 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 parabolic. And moreover, uh, uh, under some finite 
discover, it becomes the product or over the function field, it becomes product, something like that. So there's a more def general definition of Brewer-Tits group schemes, but we are dealing with this special class of Brewer-Tits group schemes. And uh, that is where we prove the result in. Now, one generalization of that is that don't take the trivial group scheme over sigma. You can take arbitrary group scheme over sigma. Okay. Uh, you take arbitrary uh, uh, group scheme over sigma. That means you are going to take a, uh, a, a, a bundle, a G bundle over sigma. And you can do exactly the same construction and you will get a more general Bruhartet's group scheme. But our result does not say anything to that. We are restricted to this particular type of uh, Bruhartet group schemes. Does this long answer uh, uh, answer your short question? Uh, it, it was helpful, thank you, yeah. Say it again. Uh, it was helpful, thank you. Yeah, okay, very good. Any other questions? Um, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, so maybe I could ask. Yeah, of yeah. course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the chairman of the committee also <laughs> is, is allowed to ask question. <laughs> so, so you have uh, a curve X, some point yeah. and a gamma action, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have curve sigma with a gamma action. Yeah, so now let's do bun, but not the conformal blocks with, with, with bundles, okay? Let's so, again. So I want to see whether there are any relay, any natural map from the old conformal blocks. So you are asking this twisted conformal block, does, does it, it have mean, any relationship admit a map to the old or Admit a block? map to some old, old conformal blocks. Right, there will be. Yeah, that is true. Will it be flat? Suitably interpreted. No, no. So you are saying that this uh, twisted conformal block is a family over the old conformal block? No, no. I mean, I, so you have a map, you have bundles, and then you have uh, bundles with more structure. So they'll probably have right. a map from that's one right. way to exactly. the other. Right? Exactly. So that's you pull right. back line bundles from one stack to the other stack. Yeah. That's right. And uh, so will this global, will this uh, map on global sections be flat for connections? Uh, okay, that's a very good question. I don't know a, at least an immediate answer. So, so uh, firstly, is there such a map? I just said it kind yeah, of vaguely. Yeah, yeah, your question makes perfectly good sense that uh, we have a connection on both the sides, and the question is, is that compatible? Right, and firstly, is there a map in the suitably formulated? Yeah. Uh, Okay, so that's also not. I mean, I, I uh, asked just there will be from the bungee picture. It may follow, right? Uh, yeah. In the uh, bun picture, there is certainly hmm. I mean, and there are several constructions in in. With curves of the the you know uh, double cover right right uh, hyperelliptic right. covers so and whether those maps are flat whether there are right maps right. in fact I'm just trying to okay so there is. We could continue later, so One uh, part I am not, uh, yeah, I'm not totally. Okay, I can tell you, okay, so, so, so I can tell you what is the par bun in this picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me give you par bun in this picture. So in the twisted picture, so so I'm I'm just going to call it twisted power one. Okay, mm. so what is twisted power one? I will give you the uniformization theorem, which also actually we prove in our paper. And let me tell you exactly what it is. So this is g sigma minus gamma p orbits. We do that, and then we take gamma invariant, and then we do product.
g mod okay okay so i'm 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 going to say gpi mod pi qi so let me explain this in a okay so let me first yes right so what is this notation so this notation is clear so we are taking again sigma minus all the uh, uh, gamma orbits we are removing and then we take the gamma invariant now what is this object so what is gpi so pi is the isotropy of gamma pi so pi let's take gamma pi now gamma pi acts on g right i mean gamma pi is acting on the lie algebra and g is simply connected so it will act on g and gamma pi so we just take the invariants of gamma so this is nothing but g gamma pi okay now what is this uh, 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 pi now we have those weights lambda i and they tra gets translated into parabolic weights which i will just call it tau 1 through tau s and through any of those tau i we have the kempf parabolic pi so that's the untwisted picture i'm saying so to lambda i it will go to some some uh, 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 parabolic weights so tau i is kempf and now to, to tau i i associate the kempf parabolic pi which basically means that its levy corresponds to those things where ti tau i vanish okay right and now this pi qi oops no no not qi it's pi sorry sorry pi is nothing but now you take pi and again you take the invariant with respect to pi okay so that's the twisted par par a par one now if i take the usual par one usual par one will be g sigma minus p no gamma invariant and we will have g mod pi right so that's the usual par one and now i have the twisted par one so the question is of course g sigma minus gamma p invariants you see there is of course a map from g pi to pi pi to g mod pi the restriction map Mm -hmm. but i don't see a map from this to g sigma minus p yeah oh do i no no one minute one minute one minute i mean it looks yeah so there is no map here i don't see any map here although it's gamma invariant right but i think we have 10 more minutes i could ask you this little later so yeah yeah okay yeah, are there yeah. any other questions anyone um well okay so maybe then we should thank the speaker again yeah.